Welcome to the second part of the Sabbath Enrichment Seminar with Dr. Samuel Bakioki. In his opening presentation, Dr. Bakioki shared his gripping testimony of how the Lord providentially led his parents to discover the Sabbath through a Bible donated them by a Waldensian friend. We heard of how the Sabbath uh, soon became a testing truth both for his parents and for himself. For Samuel Bakioki, the ridicule, rejection, and persecution he faced as a young man for honoring the Savior on the Sabbath inspired his dream to investigate which really is God's holy day and what it should mean for our Christian life today. He shared how his dream came true when he saw his doctoral dissertation from Sabbath to Sunday rolling off of Vatican Press. He would never have dreamed that he would receive a gold medal from the Pope for his research which proves the validity and value of the Sabbath for our day and our Christian lives today. The second presentation is entitled, The Sabbath as a Time for Service. It's a practical meditation on how to keep the Sabbath uh, to gain the greatest blessings from it. Dr. Bakioki will share with us some basic principles that can make Sabbath keeping an enriching day of service to God, ourselves, and others. Now here's Dr. Bakioki. Welcome friends to the second session of our Sabbath Enrichment Seminar. In the first session, I shared with you the story of the Sabbath in my life, how the Lord opened the door for me to enter, study, research, and publish the Sabbath inside the Vatican University there in Rome, Italy. I shared with you how the Pope himself was so gracious to award me a gold medal for the summa cum laude distinction I earn in my research and how the Lord is using this research around the world to help many people to understand and accept God's holy day. This morning our meditation is entitled The Sabbath as a Time of Service. We like to explore together how on and through the Sabbath we serve God ourselves and others. I believe that this is a very practical meditation which will help us understand some of the fundamental principles of Sabbath keeping. But before we begin our Bible study, let us invite God's presence and spirit in our midst. Thank you, God, for the opportunity this morning to come together to study thy word, to explore more fully how on and through the Sabbath we can serve thee, O God, ourselves and others. I pray that this meditation may enrich our understanding and experience of thy holy day, that we may learn how on and through this day we can draw closer to thee and closer to one another, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. This meditation this morning is taken from the seventh chapter of my book, Divine Rest, a book which has been translated in over 20 languages and has blessed many people around the world. You know, we live today in a most exciting and paradoxical age. Isn't it true? We can race the sun across the sky, even send spacecraft to Mars, as it happened a few days ago, and yet we sometimes have difficulty to reach the needy the poor, the frustrated who may be living next door to us. We can uh, tune our radio and TV sets to sounds and pictures coming from outer space. And yet there are many who have difficulty to tune their heart, mind and soul to God and to hear His voice. You know, we can dial a few numbers and talk with our loved ones across the ocean. And yet we sometimes have difficulty to communicate with our husbands, wife, and children. You know, we live and move among large crowds today. I discovered that recently when I was there in Tokyo, Japan, at, uh, Seoul, Korea, 20 million people living in those big metropolis. Wherever you go, you feel congested. You know, you go on the underground, you see a flow of people that carry you along. You don't even have to make any effort, you know, to move because the, the, the crowd, pushes you along and yet there are so many people today who are experiencing an identity crisis, loneliness in their life. To sum it all up we can say we live in a paradoxical age today. On one hand we are enjoying increased communication, conveniences and comforts but on the other hand 
there are so many people that are physically exhausted, emotionally frustrated, people that have lost the assurance in the existence of God and in a divine solution to our human problem. So the question that we like to ask this morning is, what contribution can the Sabbath make towards solving some of these human problems? And to guide our reflection, I'd like to propose you this morning to consider with me three vital areas of service that the Sabbath provides. First of all, the Sabbath as service to God. Secondly, the Sabbath as service to ourselves. And lastly, the Sabbath as service to others. So these are the three major parts of our meditation this morning. The Sabbath as service to God. Repeatedly, the scripture reminds us that the seventh day is holy unto the Lord our God. Obviously, we serve God every day, don't we? But there is a difference between the weekday service and the Sabbath service. What is the difference? Well, to illustrate it, I like to use the example of Mary and Martha. Do you remember what happened when Jesus went to visit these two sisters in Bethany? You remember how Martha got busy to prepare the food, to prepare the place, to ensure that Jesus would be comfortable. And wouldn't you say that you and I, like Martha during the week, we are busy, serving a human employer, meeting the many demands of life. Wouldn't you say that you and I during the week serve the Lord subconsciously like Martha? But on the Sabbath we serve the Lord like Mary. What did Mary do? She dropped everything and she sat at the feet of Jesus. Isn't it true? May I propose to you this morning that this is the essence of Sabbath keeping, giving priority to God in our thinking, in our living during the 24 hours of the Sabbath. I'd like to emphasize this morning that this act of resting for God on the Sabbath is a very meaningful act of worship because it expresses our total commitment to the Lord. If you were to ask me this morning, Brother Sam, I told you last night, don't worry about Bakiyuki, too complicated. Call me Brother Sam. Brother Sam, last night you told us you spent five years there in the Vatican uh, uh, investigating the change from Sabbath to Sunday. Well, in the light of all the research that you did, what would you say is the essential difference between Sabbath keeping and Sunday keeping? If you were to pose that question to me, my answer is rather simple. The difference is to be found in the act of resting as an act of worship. Let me explain to you what I mean. What I discovered is that Sabbath keeping was established by God at creation as a day. A day of fellowship, a day of worship, a day of service. But Sunday keeping was introduced by the bishops of Rome, not as a day, but as an hour of worship. I don't know if you were aware of that. The earliest document that comes down to us from about 150, the middle of the second century, Justin Martyr, one of the leaders there in the Church of Rome, what does he tell us? That Christians of a Gentile background came together early on the Dia Solis, on the day of the sun. They had a little worship service, and then what? Then they went back to work. The rest of the day was business as usual. And shall I tell you, in spite of the effort that were later made by Constantine in 321 when he promulgated the famous Constantinian Sunday law, in spite of the effort that were later made by popes, by church council, by Puritans to make Sunday into a total day of rest and worship, the historical reality that Sunday began as an hour not as a day. And the recognition of this historical reality has led the Catholic Church. While I was studying right there, about 30 years ago, they decided to anticipate the first Sunday Mass to Saturday afternoon. Did you know that today in all the Catholic churches around the world, Catholics can fulfill their Sunday mass obligation by going to church on Saturday afternoon? And I was reading recently in the Sunday magazine of the Lord's Day Alliance of the United States that 10,000 Protestant churches in America have adopted the same practice of offering a Sabbath afternoon or a Sabbath evening service to those who cannot make it to church on Sunday. One of the church, for example, is the Willow Creek Church. They have two services on Saturday afternoon to accommodate the yuppies, those who don't want to get out of bed on Sunday morning. Now, folks, let me tell you this. 
This may be good enough for Sunday keeping, because after all, Sunday keeping began as the hour, not as the day of rest and worship unto the Lord. But it's not good enough for, uh, for Sabbath keeping, uh, because the essence of Sabbath keeping is not just going to church, but is giving priority to God in our thinking, in our living during the 24 hours of the Sabbath. I want you to notice that there are two components in the Sabbath commandment. Number one, it says, six day thou shalt labor and do all thy work. Now, we often don't think it that way, but resting and uh, working on the six days is part of Sabbath keeping. Did you know that? Did you know that you could break the Sabbath on a Tuesday? How? By loafing around, doing nothing. You know, the Sabbath challenges us to be productive. The more I study about the Sabbath, the more I became conscious of the value of time. I became conscious of the fact that I cannot afford to waste my time. You will never catch me watching a silly movie because my time is too valuable. And I think this is something to remember because if you and I are able to get our work done during the week, when Friday night comes, we have reason to celebrate. We celebrate not only God's creative and redemptive accomplishment, but we also celebrate what you and I, by God's grace, have been able to accomplish during the week which has gone by. But the second part of Sabbath keeping is resting on the seventh day unto the Lord. Why why is God inviting us to rest? What is the function, the purpose of our resting on the Sabbath? I believe that an important function is to give us the opportunity to take time to remember. That is the very first word of the command. Remember what? Remember that God has created us perfectly. Remember that he has redeemed us completely. Remember that he is interceding for us constantly. Remember that he will restore us ultimately. Basically, this is the good news of the Sabbath. Perfect creation, complete redemption, and final restoration. And as we take time to remember on the Sabbath what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will do for us, we are able to cultivate our relationship with the Lord. I like to think of the Sabbath as the day when we welcome the Savior as our special guest of honor. I remember that when our children were growing, I would remind myself, my wife and the children on Friday night, that when we were opening the Sabbath, we were not just welcoming a day, but we were welcoming the Lord of the Sabbath. You know, I'm often a guest in homes, in my itinerant ministry around the world, and it's amazing how mother will tell the children, be quiet, Dr. Bakyoki may be resting, may be praying, may be studying. Don't make noise. Have you noticed how we take notice when we have a special guest in our home? May I remind us that the Sabbath is the day when we should uh, welcome the Savior as our special invisible guest of honor. Which this means that all what we do on the Sabbath, whether we participate in a corporate worship experience, where we are enjoying some fellowship, some recreation, visitation, all of it should spring out of a heart who has decided to honor God on his holy day. This enable us to cultivate in a special way our relationship with the Savior. I like to illustrate this with a personal experience. My wife and I spent four years at Newball College. In those days we were engaged, we were not married. And you know what? You might be interested to know that at Newball College, in those days, we are talking about 40 years ago, there was a privileged system. How did it work? If a couple, by the way, did you see that in those days I had nice wavy hair? Isn't it nice? I don't want you to think I've been shining all my life, you know? <laughs> now, uh, let me tell you about the privileged system. If a, a couple that was dating, if they were A students, academically and morally, they had the opportunity of meeting for one hour, once a week, in the girls' lounge dormitory, under supervision, obviously. But if a couple were B students, they had to wait for two weeks before they could spend an hour together. Can you believe that? And the C students, mamma mia, they would have to wait for one month before they could spend an hour together. Let me assure you that uh, we always try to be A students. Why? Because one hour, 
once a week was the minimum <laughs> indispensable for the survival of our relationship. Now I have good news. The Sabbath is indeed God's a privilege, but a privilege that lasts not for one hour, but for 24 hours. Now you may be wondering, why am I emphasizing this whole concept of the 24-hour day? Do you know why? In my itinerant ministry around the world, I found that there are some of our fellow believers who have adopted the mentality that when the church service is over, the Sabbath is over. They go home, they take off the Sabbath clothes, they put them back in the closet, they close the closet, and they close the Sabbath. You know what I mean? Turn on the TV, watch entertaining program, perhaps go out to eat to in a restaurant or to a place of entertainment. The rest of the day becomes business as usual. And my concern, fellow believers and friends, is to help us recapture the biblical vision of the Sabbath, not as an hour, but as a 24 hours. 24 hours day in which in all what we do and say, we are conscious of the fact that we are honoring the invisible presence of our Savior. It doesn't mean that we have to spend the Sabbath, you know, paralytic, you know, like mummies. I don't believe that the Lord is excited to look at mummies on the Sabbath. Some people feel that the only suitable Sabbath activity is the lay activity. You heard about the lay activity, the horizontal sleeping activity. No, 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 no. I don't believe that the Lord is excited by looking at people either being paralytic or being sleeping on the Sabbath. I believe that what pleases God it's not just the action or inaction, but the intention why we do what we do on the Sabbath. I can go for a walk on the Sabbath because I said, you know, I was overseas. And in fact, last year I was in 15 countries, uh, 43 weekends and 15 countries overseas. And many times when I go overseas, my wife is not there to check on me, so I indulge in some sweets. I have a sweet tooth. Uh, does anybody have the same problem like me? And so I sometimes have a problem with weight. I said, you know, now it is Sabbath. Why don't I? take advantage of some free time and go for a nice energetic walk hoping to lose some weight. If I take a walk on the Sabbath hoping to lose some weight, is that God-centered or self-centered? What would you say? Self-centered, isn't it true? But if I go out on the walk for the Sabbath because I want to delight in the goodness, in the beauty of God's creation, that is God-centered, isn't it? So the problem, the point I'm trying to make this morning Sometimes it's not the action or inaction, but the intention. Are you with me? It's why we do what we do on the Sabbath. Do we do it just to gratify ourselves? Or do we do to express our delight and our joy in the Lord? Now the question is, why is God asking for our Sabbath time? I believe that the answer is to be found in the fact that the way we use our time is indicative of our priorities. Isn't it true? If you don't particularly like somebody, you have a simple excuse. But I'm sorry that I don't have time. But when we love somebody, when we care for somebody, even if we are plenty busy, we take time. We make time for that person. And when you and I give priority to God on the Sabbath, we show in a concrete, tangible way that God really counts in our life. In fact, let me say this. I believe that one of the reasons why the Sabbath is going to be such a testing truth in this final hour of world history is because we live today in a very self-centered society. Would you agree with me on that? Isn't it true that people are much more interested in what pleases them than in what pleases God? People want to seek for profit, for pleasure, not for the presence and the peace of God in their life. And may I propose to you that this is why the Sabbath is so controversial. You know what? You will not find doctoral dissertation disputing the other nine commandments. Only the Sabbath commandment has been disputed through the century. We are going to study about it in the, in the, in the fourth lecture. You will see that 3,000 treaties have been written since the time of the Reformation. Debate in the Sabbath Sunday question. And if you go to Amazon.com and punch in the word Sabbath, you will find that there are 358 books for sale debating the Sabbath Sunday question, including the four books I have written myself. Why is the Sabbath so controversial? May I propose to you that the major reason is because the Sabbath summons us to consecrate our time to God. And people are very touched about their time. People want to use their time to seek for pleasure, to seek for profit, not to seek for the present and the peace of God. Are you with me? 
And this is why I believe that when we give priority to God on the Sabbath, we show in a concrete, tangible way that God really counts in our life. To observe a holy day means to accept the challenge to be a holy man, a holy woman in a secularly minded and perverse generation. I was reading the other day the statement of a Jewish scholar who says, the Sabbath has preserved the Jews more than the Jews have preserved the Sabbath. How do you like that? Don't you think it could apply to us as a church? That the Sabbath can preserve us as a people help us to retain our sense of identity, our sense of mission, more than we, uh, as Adventists, can preserve the Sabbath. But the Sabbath service to God is also service to ourselves. A very vital function of the Sabbath is to make us receptive, responsive to the working of God. On the Sabbath, God invites us to stop our work so that he can work in us more fully and more freely. By the way, this is salvation by grace. Isn't it true? I was invited some time ago in Atlanta, Georgia, to speak to 150 church leaders representing 21 denominations. And one of, the, uh, one of the gentlemen, he was Professor Seller, I don't know who he was, basically, asked me this very pointed question, aren't you legalist? by emphasizing the observance of the Sabbath. I said, friend, how can I be a legalist? A legalist is one that works for his own salvation, but on the Sabbath I don't work. I'm resting on the Sabbath. How can I be a legalist? For me, the act of resting is an act of resignation to my human effort to achieve salvation. It's an act whereby I make myself free and available for God and allow God's omnipotent grace to work more fully in my life. You know what? He kept his mouth shut. He had nothing to add. Because properly understood, the Sabbath is an expression of salvation by grace. We stop our work to allow our Savior to work in us more fully and more freely. Now the question is, how can we experience mental, physical, and spiritual renewal on the Sabbath? May I share with you three suggestions? Number one, rest on the Sabbath as if all your work was done. That is not easy to do, by the way. We often begin the week by saying, this week I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Are you one of those organizers, eh? And then what happens? The week goes by so fast. Friday night seems to arrive earlier than you anticipated. You look at the watch and what do you say? In Italian we say, mamma mia, it's already sunset. You don't say mamma mia. What do you say? Wow, it's already sunset. And I still have so many things to do. I haven't finished my term paper. I haven't finished the chapter of my book. I haven't finished this business transaction. I haven't finished the cleaning. I haven't finished the cooking. I did not even have enough time to wash my hair. That's very easy for me to do, by the way. The Lord has simplified my life. Not so easy for me my wife because she has to put on those curly stuff. You know what I mean? Then she goes under a cask and she sits there to dry her hair and if I happen to be home, I always like to tease my wife. Darling, you must be doing penance for your sins now. <laughs> We haven't finished, but we stop because it is sunset. We may stop our work, but we do not necessarily stop worrying about the work that remains to be done. And you know, we may be tempted during the Sabbath to plan the work that we are going to do as soon as the Sabbath is over. May I propose to you that that is the best way to spoil the Sabbath? Because worrying about unfinished work is as taxing and consuming as doing the work itself. I like to remind us that the Sabbath invites us to rest not only from work, but even from the thought of work. This is why the Sabbath rest is special. Why is it special? Because on the Sabbath, our body can rest better than on weekdays. Why? Because our mind is at rest. And our mind is at rest because it rests in God. Have you found that to be true? That Friday night is the best night of rest? You know, whenever I go to bed at night, I'm already pre-programmed. I have a built-in alarm system. When 5 o'clock comes, you can be sure that I wake up. I don't need to have the alarm system. I have it built in because I'm already pre-programmed. I have to get up. I get 200 email messages a day from all over the world. And I always have more work to do than time available. And so I'll need to get an early start. 
But when Friday night comes, you know, I went to bed last night. I was a bit tired after this exciting presentation. I was really uh, appreciative of your warm reception and response. But uh, you know what I did when I went to bed last night? I turned off the alarm system because it is, it is Sabbath. I don't have to worry about waking up at 5 o'clock in the morning. And would you believe it? This morning I slept until 10 to 8. I said, I better hurry up. I wanted to have a little bit of time to go over my presentation. Because, uh, you know what, it was Sabbath, and it is Sabbath, I can put my mind at rest. Isn't it beautiful? And on the Sabbath, our body can rest better because our mind is at rest, and our mind is at rest because it's resting God. Let me tell you something, folks. If you and I want to become successful in sharing the Sabbath with our Christian friends of all their friends, let us be sure that we enjoy the Sabbath. Let us be sure that we experience the benefits of the Sabbath. Are you with me? You know, whenever I get invited to speak to clergy of other faith, when I was there in Seattle speaking to 150 clergymen of different denominations, I shared with them how the Sabbath brings peace, release, renewal to my life, and I shared the same sermon I'm going to be preaching in the next session, seven ways in which the Sabbath brings Christ's peace and rest of my life. You should have seen those, those men sitting on the edge of the pews. As soon as I finished, you know, they dashed in the foyer to buy my Sabbath books, and one of them, a Nazarene minister, dashed forth and said, Dr. Bakioki, would you preach the same sermon to my congregation? That was in Seattle. We are in Michigan. I told, sir, it would cost you $500 to fly me to your church. No problem. We'll be delighted. I want our people, our congregation, to discover the benefits of the Sabbath. This has happened time and again. I was there in Tokyo just about six months ago. There was a minister of a congregation, a Protestant church that attended the meeting. He got so excited. He said, would you preach the same sermon? to my congregation on Sunday. I said, I have to leave. I'm booked with United Airlines. They are the friendly sky, but not the free sky. If you change your schedule, you have to pay a penalty of $150. So what if we give you $1,000? Would you be willing to stay? How could I say no? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and then you will see the picture this afternoon. Uh, in the next, uh, uh, in the fourth lecture, I'll show you the picture of this beautiful church where I was invited to preach the good news of the Sabbath. This this is my philosophy, folks. People are interested in benefits. And if you and I can help people discover the Sabbath, not as a burden, but as a benefit, they become excited about, about the Sabbath. Now, a second suggestion I'd like to make in planning for our Sabbath celebration, let us plan for a time of meditation. I believe that if ever there was a time when we needed a time of meditation, such time is today when many people live intensively active, rushing, restless lives. And the inner peace and rest is to be found not by rushing, not by constant doing, by being still. You remember what the psalmist says? Be still and know that I am God. I'd like to propose to you that the Sabbath provides us with the time and the opportunity for enriching meditation. We can meditate in various ways. We can meditate by reading the Word of God, devotional literature. May I propose to you that there is a difference between reading for investigation and reading for meditation. I spend many hours each day investigating the scripture. But during the week when I read for investigation, I read analytically. I look at the text, the, text, the, word, the literary structure, the historical background. I use all the tools of research to extract all the meaning, the juice out of the text. But on the Sabbath when I read, I don't have to investigate, I don't have to analyze, I just have to read and reread and let the thought sink into my conscience, into my mind, and let the Lord speak, you know, to the spiritual needs of my soul, you know, through His Word. This kind of, this kind of meditative reading is very essential for our spiritual growth. Some people may choose to meditate by listening to some sacred music. Perhaps you may wish to meditate with your spouse. You may wish to meditate by contemplating the beauty of nature. The the important thing is to spend some time on the Sabbath meditating on spiritual reality. This gives a chance to our souls to catch up with our bodies. Let me illustrate this with a story from Africa. I spent five years in Ethiopia serving there as a Bible teacher and pastor of the college church. And uh, one day an expedition came to Ethiopia 
They had some heavy pieces of equipment to carry in the interior where there were, there were no roads, there were only pathways. So what did they do? They hired some workers. And it's very easy to get some help, you know. I remember when we had to leave Ethiopia, I went outside the mission office. I, I just shouted, Kule, 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 Kule. <laughs> In a matter of a few seconds, I had a bunch of people that for a coin, for 25 cents, would take my baggage anywhere. I tell you, it's so nice to get so much help. If I was to shout outside my home, Kule, 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 <laughs> nobody. I would just freeze to death. <laughs> and nobody would ever <laughs> come out to help me. But, you know, this guy offered to help. But what happened? After several days of marching, they sat by the pathway and they wouldn't move. Now the leader of the expedition became exasperated because they still had a long way to go. Please, get up, let's go, we have a long way to go. They wouldn't budge. So he asked, well, why don't you want to move? And one of the native workers said, sir, we are waiting for our souls to catch up with our bodies. I like that story. I believe that it illustrates the function of the Sabbath, which is to give a chance to our souls to catch up with our bodies. During the week, we are so concerned about the physical needs of our body. The Sabbath gives us an opportunity to reflect upon the spiritual needs of our soul. A third suggestion I'd like to make to experience rest and renewal on the Sabbath, take time on the Sabbath to delight in the goodness and in the beauty of God's creation. You know, in the scripture and in Jewish and Christian history, the Sabbath has always been perceived as a delightful day. If you read the Jewish literature, you will be surprised that the best food, the best clothing, best perfume, the best oil, everything was reserved on the Sabbath. On the Sabbath, they would have some fresh olive oil, to, uh, to lighten their lamps and they would also put some special fragrance so there would be a special sabbatical atmosphere in their home and in their synagogue. And the prophet Isaiah, as you remember, says that if you turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy own pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, then thou shalt delight thyself in the Lord. Indeed, the Sabbath invites us to delight in the goodness and the beauty of God's creation. Everything is more delightful on the Sabbath. Isn't it true? The worship service is richer. Even people are more friendly. I like this picture. This is the picture of Seventh-day Adventists worshiping on the Sabbath. How do I know it? Everybody smiling. That's why I know it. You know, we can seven the Adventists smile on the Sabbath. Have you noticed that even those who during the week sometimes are a bit despondent, sad and gloomy, when the Sabbath comes, they seem to have a very pleasant smile, pleasant disposition. You know, even the food is more delicious on the Sabbath. I can eat the same spaghetti that my wife prepares during the week, but when I eat them on the Sabbath, they taste better. There is more gusto. Can you remember this? Weekdays without the Sabbath are like spaghetti without the sauce. Can you remember that? <laughs> Some Americans don't understand what I'm talking about because they can eat the spaghetti without the sauce. We Italians don't do that. <laughs> you know, sometimes in United Airlines, they serve me the spaghetti uh, with the carrots, the, the peas, and the mushroom, and I ask the flight attendant, Madam, where is the sauce? Dove la salsa? That's the way we serve them. Not to an Italian, please. We know better. If there is no sauce, it's like eating glue. Who wants to eat the glue? Only the hungry American can do that. We Italians don't do that. As a good sauce gives the gusto to the pasta, to the pizza, so a joyful Sabbath should make us happy every day. Don't you think so? How many of you feel that the Seventh-day Adventists should be the happiest people on the face of the earth? Do you believe that? Good. You know, whenever I see a happy person, I always assume he or she must be a Seventh-day Adventist. It's not always true. I discovered it recently when I was flying to Orlando. I was sitting next to a lady, charming lady, clean-looking lady, without jewelry, very modestly dressed. I helped her to put her coat and her bag on the overhead bin, and as we sat down, I was a bit aggressive, perhaps. My wife tells me, watch out, because you are too aggressive sometimes. Well, I don't know, I felt the inspiration to ask her a question. Madam, may I ask you a question? Are you perchance a Seventh-day Adventist? You are a happy, clean-looking lady. You just look like an Adventist sister. I'm not. I'm sorry to disappoint you. I'm not. 
but I know a lot about you people. What do you know? Well, she says, my company sold six million dollars of software, hardware to the Sun Belt Medical System. That is a system that administers all the hospitals there in the south, in the Orlando area. I don't know if you are aware of the fact, but we Adventists operate 80% of the hospital bed are operated by our church. We have about 10 hospitals there on the Orlando area. And she said, I have been out eating with your administrator. I know among other things that you are predominantly vegetarian. Well, I said, I'm so glad that you already know quite a few things about us. Now we are going to be flying together for two hours. Why don't I tell you what you don't know so you can become one of us? You already look like a Seventh-day Adventist. You, and you just have to become one. And she got excited, and I got excited. Uh, she opened up herself and told me about her life, that she was a Baptist dating a Catholic guy. She was very concerned about what would happen if they were to get married and so on. But there was a gentleman next to her who was trying to rest. We never gave him the chance. We were yucking all the time. So half, half an hour later, he broke in and said, I've been trying to rest with, with no success. You never stop talking. Why don't you make me part of your conversation? Said, Zero in, my friend. Zero in, my friend. By the time we got to Orlando, I had a business card from both of them. You know, Ellen White tells us that God gives us the opportunity. Success depends upon the use that we make of them. But the Sabbath is also service to other. God has given us the Sabbath not only to be able to serve Him and ourselves, but also to reach out unto others. Have you noticed how in the Sabbath commandment there is a long list of persons to be remembered on the Sabbath? And not only the son and the daughter, but the manservant, the maidservant, the alien, even the animals are to be remembered on the Sabbath. And did you notice how Jesus spent the Sabbath not in splendid isolation? in the woods, in the forest with the binocular looking at the butterflies and the birds and the trees. Jesus spent the Sabbath offering a living, loving service to human need. There are seven Sabbath healing episodes reported in the gospel and it's interesting to see what Jesus said about the Sabbath. You know sometimes I meet people who believe that the Sabbath is Old Testament stuff. It's nowhere to be found in the New Testament. I often wonder what kind of Bible they are using because there is more coverage given to the Sabbath teaching, to the Sabbath ministry of Jesus than to any other aspect of his ministry. What did Jesus say about the Sabbath? The Sabbath is the day to do good, Matthew 12, 12. The Sabbath is the day to save, Mark 3, 4. The Sabbath is the day to liberate men and women from physical and spiritual bond, Luke chapter 13, verse 12. The Sabbath is the day of mercy, Jesus said. The Sabbath was made for our human benefit, Mark 2, 27. Now, with whom should we share the Sabbath? Who are the people that we should reach out on the Sabbath? Number one, our family members. Number two, our marital partner. Number three, the needy people. First of all, I believe that the Sabbath should be a happy family celebration. Do you believe that? I believe the Sabbath should bring the family close together. Particularly father who is often away and busy during the week. On the Sabbath he has a unique opportunity to come closer and bond with his children. Mother should prepare a special meal for the Sabbath. That's what Ellen White says. In fact, I was surprised when she mentioned that mother should prepare a special dessert for the Sabbath. Six Testimony 351, if you want the reference. I like that. I like that because during the week my wife keeps a check on me she says, you do not need dessert you need to lose weight stay away from dessert so I have a sweet tooth you know so when I finish a meal I almost have a craving to to put something sweet in my mouth does anybody else have the same problem <laughs> you know I don't know if you can relate to me but you know during the week my wife uh, wants me to exercise self-control but when the Sabbath comes says, darling please give me a break <laughs> it is Sabbath. Even Ellen White says we can have a sweet on the Sabbath. That's why Ellen White is a sweet lady, don't you think so? <laughs> well, well, well. The Sabbath also should bring husband and wife closer together. 
The more I studied about the Sabbath, the more I became excited about marriage. Do you know why? Because these two institutions come down to us from the Garden of Eden. And both the Sabbath and marriage are the sign of a covenant relationship, as we will see. You remember how God created this beautiful world, and then he gave the assignment to Adam to classify the animal, the bird, the trees, to do this biological, botanical classification. And Adam apparently did the job very well, very fast, but in, in searching for a mate, he found that everybody had a mate. He was the only one that uh, did not have a companion. And he must have asked God, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to go to bed with monkeys? Eh? And God recognized that something wasn't quite right. And what did God say? It is not good for man to be alone. And the Bible tells us that God remedied a not good situation right away. He caused a deep sleep to fall upon man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and he made it into a woman. God created Miss Universe. And when Adam was hardly awake and saw this beautiful woman... Mamma mia, he must have said, I don't know if he spoke Italian, but said, wow, this is it. She is the, she's the girl of my dreams. And when God saw that they were so excited, without wasting any time, he united them in holy matrimony, saying, a man will live father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, I like to point out that both the Sabbath and marriage are the sign of a covenant relationship. The Sabbath expresses our covenant commitment to God. Marriage expresses our covenant commitment to our partner. And I find that the Sabbath can strengthen marital relationship. How? Theologically and practically. Theologically, the sanctity of the Sabbath reminds us of the sacredness of our marital relationship. And practically, I believe that the Sabbath should bring husband and wife closer together. The other day, somebody were asking me, what about intimate relationship on the Sabbath? That's a good question. We may like to discuss it in the question and answer period. Now, I present all of this biblical principle for building a happy and lasting marriage in my book, The Marriage Covenant, which we want to make available to all of you. Now, I want you to notice that Jesus taught that the Sabbath is not just rules to obey, but is people to love. In every church, in every community, there are some who are hurting. They may have lost a job. They have, may have been diagnosed with an incurable disease. They may have had an accident. They may be going through a moment of depression. Sometimes during the week we say, you know what, I should go and visit so-and-so. I should go and comfort so-and-so. I should go and encourage so-and-so. But you know what, we are so busy. We don't always have time, you know, to, to reach out and touch the lives of others. I'd like to propose to you that God has given us the Sabbath to provide us with the time and the opportunity to reach out unto others. And my appeal to all of us this morning as we are closing this meditation is let us reach out on the Sabbath toward those who are sick and suffering, toward those who need our word of encouragement. And let me tell you this. In planning for our Sabbath celebration, if we can plan to spend one hour, perhaps even half an hour, to visit somebody, to encourage somebody, to cheer up somebody. You know what? At the end of the Sabbath, you will feel good about the Sabbath. Why? To the extent that you have been a blessing unto others on the Sabbath, to that same degree the Sabbath has been a blessing to you. This is exactly how it works. Well, in closing this morning, we have seen how the Sabbath provides us with time and opportunity to serve God, ourselves, and others. We serve God by giving priority to God in our thinking and in our living on the Sabbath. We serve ourselves by experiencing mental, physical, and spiritual renewal. We serve others by reaching out to our family members, marital partner, and needy people. My fervent hope and prayer for each one of us is that the Sabbath may truly become for us an enriching day of service to God, ourselves, and others. May the Sabbath become a day when we stop our work to allow our Savior to work in us more fully and more freely. May the Sabbath become a day when we experience in a special way the awareness of the presence, 
peace and rest of Christ in our lives. This is my prayer for each one of us this morning. Let us pray. Thank you, O God, for the gift of the Sabbath, for this uh, appointment in time that invites us every week to make ourselves free and available for Thee. We want to thank you, O God, because Thou hast given us this day in which we can serve Thee, ourselves, and others. May the Sabbath truly really become for us an enriching day of service, a day when we draw closer to Thee and closer to one another. May the Sabbath truly really become for us the day when we experience in a special way the awareness of Thy presence, peace, and rest in our lives. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen.